This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hi, good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Annie Van Bunigan. Um, for those who don't know me, one of the heart failure faculty at um, EUH. And I have the um, great uh, privilege this morning of introducing our grand round speaker, who's my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Michael Honingberg. Dr. Honingberg uh, received his uh, bachelor's degree from Princeton University before going on to receiving his medical degree from Harvard Medical School. He completed internship and residency in internal medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and completed his uh, clinical and research fellowship in cardiovascular medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's been the recipient of numerous clinical and research awards, including the Roman De Sanctis Clinical Scholar Award, the Jeremiah Stamler Award from Northwestern Cardiovascular Young Investigators Forum, and he was the recipient of the 2023 um, Douglas Zipes Distinguished Young Scientist Award from the American College of Cardiology. Dr. Honingberg's research combines classical epidemiology, human genomics, multiomics approaches, and imaging to elucidate sex-specific risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women and their underlying mechanisms. Um, he works to improve cardiovascular risk prediction and allocation of existing and novel preventative therapies and define precision strategies for cardiovascular risk reduction in high-risk populations, which we'll hear about today. We're so excited to have you, Mike. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Annie, uh, for that kind introduction and um, to the Grand Rounds organizers for this really kind invitation. It's great to be with everybody uh, virtually this morning. Um, so yeah, excited to talk to you all about um, some of our recent work to understand um, sex-specific and sex-predominant risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women. These are my disclosures. Um, by way of brief background to set the stage for this talk a little bit, I thought I'd just share some key findings from the recent Lancet Commission on Women in Cardiovascular Diseases report entitled Reducing the Global Burden of Cardiovascular Disease in Women by 2030. The I mean, this is a very extensive report, but I think some really important messages from the commission included the fact that women with cardiovascular disease are understudied, underrecognized, and undertreated in contemporary practice, that sex-specific mechanisms in the pathophysiology of cardiovascular disease remain incompletely understood, that myocardial infarction and cardiovascular mortality are increasing among young women. That's definitely true in the United States. And that sex-specific and other underrecognized risk factors, such as psychosocial risk factors, contribute disproportionately to the global burden of cardiovascular disease in women. I had the privilege of leading this um, review in circulation research last year, where we attempted to collate the existing literature on sex-specific reproductive risk factors, aspects of reprodu reproductive history that uniquely either causally influence or at least reveal or predict later life cardiovascular disease risk in women. And each of these aspects of reproductive history could probably be a grand rounds talk in and of itself, but some key aspects of reproductive history for which we have fairly robust literature include um, very early or very late age of menarche, polycystic ovary syndrome, infertility, um, I should probably add menstrual irregularity to the list. Um, a host of adverse pregnancy outcomes, including preeclampsia and gestational diabetes. Grand multiparity, or having a large, a particularly large number of children. Uh, lack of breastfeeding. And then various aspects of the menopause transition, including premature or early age of menopause onsets, surgically induced menopause, severe vasomotor menopausal symptoms, and prolonged and or very late use of hormone therapy. My work, in largely inspired by the ACC AHA guidelines, since fellowship has focused primarily on aspects of these two buckets, and I'm gonna tell two stories today related to pregnancy and menopause. I'm gonna start by talking about this notion of preeclampsia as a cardiovascular condition. Next, I'm gonna talk about some of our work to understand links between premature onset of menopause and cardiovascular disease, and then I'll conclude with some perhaps aspirational thoughts about how we might imagine the future of women's cardiovascular health research. So starting with preeclampsia, this is a condition that perhaps adult cardiologists don't think about very much in their day-to-day -day practice. So just to uh, refresh everyone's memory, um, 
preeclampsia and gestational hypertension or two hypertensive disorders of pregnancy or HDPs for short. Um, pregnancy specific conditions that complicate quite a large number of pregnancies. 15% of US women experience an HDP in one or more pregnancy and up to 8% eight, uh, 8 of childbearing individuals experience preeclampsia at least once. On a global stage, these are a leading cause of maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality with a burden that's disproportionately born in the Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. Uh, the, pre the, the pathophysiology of preeclampsia is complex, and I would argue still somewhat incompletely understood, but based on what we understand today in 2023, um, the pathophysiology begins quite early in pregnancy with impaired trophoblast invasion and remodeling of the maternal spiral arteries that feed blood to the placenta. Later in gestation, this leads to inadequate uh, uteroplacental perfusion and placental hypoxia. And this appears to kick off a cascade of bad things, including an excess uh, of circulating placentally derived factors crossing into the maternal circulation, proteins like SFLT1, and soluble endoglin, which we know now play, particularly for SFLT1, play a causal role in the pathobiology of preeclampsia. This in turn leads to a maternal syndrome of systemic endothelial dysfunction and anti-angiogenesis that culminates in the clinical manifestations of preeclampsia, namely things like hypertension and proteinuria. Clinical risk factors for preeclampsia um, used to be much more common in our reproductive age patients and with, you know, concerning trends in population level cardiometabolic health, they are actually not so rare anymore. Things like pre-pregnancy chronic hypertension, obesity, diabetes, kidney dysfunction, personal and family history, speaking to some of the genetic risk for these conditions that we'll talk about more in a second, uh, epidemiologically, most preeclampsia occurs in the first gestation, um, speaking perhaps to an immune-related component of the condition. Evidence-based prevention of preeclampsia in 2023 consists of low-dose aspirin beginning at 12 weeks gestation for women uh, with a, a major risk factor or multiple moderate risk factors. The CHAP trial published um, in the New England Journal last year told us that treating mild chronic hypertension to a blood pressure target less than 140 over 90 prevents preeclampsia with severe features compared to more liberal blood pressure targets. And then there's somewhat um, less robust evidence, but nonetheless suggestive evidence for some other things, such as metformin for those with obesity, um, even if they don't have diabetes. Observational data support further supporting interventions for preconception weight loss, such as weight management surgery, um, and a Mediterranean diet pattern all have supportive ob observational and or randomized evidence. Tools for treatment are currently quite crude still and consist of blood pressure control for sort of acute stabilization and prevention of acute hypertensive complications, magnesium for seizure prophylaxis, but ultimately delivery to remove the placental source of the bad anti-angiogenic humors that are driving the late stage pathophysiology. As I mentioned, we know uh, that there are concerning population level cardiometabolic trends that are certainly contributing to rising rates of hypertension in pregnancy at a population level. So things like chronic hypertension and rising rates of obesity and overweight in pre-pregnancy and, uh, and pregnant individuals certainly contributing to rising rates. And then we know even in those who lack overt pre-pregnancy cardiometabolic risk factors, that a history of an adverse pregnancy outcome, including a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, as well as others like preterm birth, small for gestational age and gestational diabetes, each, pre each predict divergent cardiometabolic risk trajectories that actually declare themselves much earlier than I think we've historically appreciated. So these are data from the new mom to be study. This is a, U a prospective U.S. cohort of, of, of female individuals who are enrolled in their first pregnancy. And you can see that uh, this is a, this was a, about half of the cohort that followed up for, for a follow-up visit at a mean three and a half years postpartum. Participants were on average just 30 years old at this follow-up study. So they're still quite young. Already nearly 40% who experienced the hypertensive disorder of pregnancy in the index pregnancy had stage one or greater chronic hypertension. That's really striking for a cohort of, of individuals who are 30 years old on average. And you can see that those with gestational diabetes weren't super far behind them. And so 
with, with that in mind, it's perhaps not entirely surprising that this earlier declaration of cardiometabolic risk factors translates into accelerated development of overt cardiovascular disease in affected individuals. Um, so this is some data that we published a few years ago now, one of my first research projects as a fellow, actually, where we looked at participants in the UK Biobank, large population-based cohort of, uh, of UK adult residents uh, in, who enrolled in midlife. And we compared those with and without a prior history of a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. And we followed them over a median about seven, eight years for the development of a host of cardiovascular outcomes. We replicated previously described associations with incident coronary artery disease, nearly twofold excess risk, similar magnitude of excess risk with heart failure, and then identified some fairly surprising associations with valvular heart disease, both in the form of aortic stenosis. Um, we excluded those with uh, documented congenital abnormalities, including bicuspid aortic valve. So we think this is native, sort of tricuspid aortic stenosis and also mitral regurgitation. And the MR signal, I should add, was not fully explained by either coronary disease or heart failure, suggesting that it there might be a component of intrinsic degenerative mitral regurgitation there as well, not simply ischemic or functional MR. Um, we followed up this work with a collaboration with investigators at the University of Bergen in Norway, trying to better understand the, the heart failure signal specifically, um, and found that women who experienced recurrent preeclampsia, so preeclampsia in greater than or equal to two births, had especially outsized risk of incident heart failure, so 4.6-fold risk over an 11-year follow-up on average. So you know, really quite high relative risks absolute risks in this age group remain fortunately quite low as these are sort of young women. Um, but if you look, their, their, their relative risk is, is, quite, is quite increased. And then until really less than two years ago, we had very, not great data on subtype of heart failure that seemed to affect this group later in life. And that relates in part to just some of the limitations of using administrative data sets and ICD codes to ascertain heart failure subtypes. Um, but in December 2021, two papers came out that shed some more light on this. Um, on the left are data from New York and Florida, uh, led by a group at WashU, who followed uh, female participants from an, from an index pregnancy over a median six years, and already in that sort of short period observed twofold hazard for incident heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, a nearly similar hazard separately for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And they did a bunch of analyses to sort of account for those as competing risks and sensitivity analyses. Um, and on the right are data that we published right around the same time from the Women's Health Initiative. So as you know, this was a, a cohort of postmenopausal women and so enrolled much later in life. Um, and we compared those with and without a prior history of both HDPs as well as other adverse pregnancy outcomes. And really only hypertensive disorders of pregnancy emerged as a significant predictor of later life heart failure. And that excess risk, again, really seemed to concentrate in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, with nearly identical effect estimates compared to the, the analysis on the left. So, um, and you know, we could talk more about some of the described epidemiologic associations, but I think the epidemiology is fairly well described at this point. So I think it's time for us to move a little bit beyond this and start to understand why, because understanding why mechanistically informs what we need to be doing about this as clinicians to mitigate this excess risk across the life course. In the UK biobank analysis that we performed between half and two thirds of this excess risk appeared to be explained by progression to chronic hypertension um, using a technique called causal mediation analysis, suggesting that chronic hypertension is a really important, uh, particularly important, fortunately, largely modifiable risk factor um, in this population. I work in a primarily human genetics lab, so that we next turn to human genetics to try to understand these relationships a little bit better. And we started with a very straightforward approach, which was to look at the genetically predicted risk of seven cardiometabolic traits and whether those in turn predicted risk of a hypertensive disorder or pregnancy. Sort of a variation of Mendelian randomization using a polygenic risk score approach. And what we found was that uh, polygenic risk for both systolic and diastolic blood pressure and separately and independently genetic risk for body mass index quite strongly predicted a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, um, suggesting that these are actually 
causal risk factors for these conditions, helping explain some of the life course biology and also uh, correctly predicting the results of the CHAP randomized trial of, of treatment of mild chronic hypertension uh, that was published last year that I mentioned. So we then followed this up with a more um, unbiased, expanded genetic discovery analysis of these conditions, um, for which there's been remarkably little published actually in the literature um, to date. So we performed an expanded genome-wide association study, or GWAS, of preeclampsia and the first distinct uh, genome-wide association study of gestational hypertension. For preeclampsia, we looked at approximately 20,000 cases and 700,000 controls. And for gestational hypertension, we were able to look at 11,000 cases and about 400,000 controls. And in the interest of time, I won't go through all of the genetic uh, association results with you in great detail. And I know there's a lot of genomics expertise at Emory, uh, but just to orient uh, everybody who doesn't spend a lot of their day thinking about genetics, these are called Manhattan plots. What we're showing here is chromosome and chromosomal position on the horizontal axis here. So these numbers uh, refer to each of our autosomal chromosomes. And then the vertical axis is the negative log of the p-value, meaning that a taller peak uh, rep, uh, indicates a smaller p-value. And typically we use fairly strict p-value correction because we're looking at so many different points in the genome. Here, the red line indicates a p-value of less than five times 10 to the minus eighth, which is fairly conventionally used in these sorts of analyses. And in brief, we discovered um, 18 uh, significant uh, genomic loci associated with one or both of these traits, uh, the majority of which replicated in uh, follow-up data sets. Um, a couple were identified in something called multi-trait analysis that I'm happy to talk more about if folks are interested. Um, I will sort of summarize the high level findings as largely converging on the set of pathways summarized here on the left. So things like angiogenesis, we, we would strongly expect to be linked to this condition based on what we understand of the biology, the causal role of SFLT1, which is really an anti-angiogenic biomarker. And we actually detected SFLT1 in the maternal genome, although this is likely tagging the fetal genome as this is really a placentally derived uh, protein. Other pathways or sort of signals that fairly consistently emerged were immune dysregulation, trophoblast development and maintenance, kidney function, which sort of makes sense when you think about the kidney manifestations of, uh, of preeclampsia with proteinuria and also the strong role of the kidney in determining hypertension risk. Um, as a cardiologist, I was particularly struck by multiple hits converging on natriuretic peptide signaling um, and then hormonal signaling and vascular tone. Uh, the net, I'll come back to the natriuretic peptide signal for just a second because it's actually um, perhaps not in the direction that one might expect from taking care of heart failure patients. So in our clinical management, we think of higher circulating natriuretic peptides as reflecting um, worse heart failure or higher risk of decompensated heart failure. But what we actually observed here was a little bit of the opposite direction of effect where Higher genetically predicted natriuretic peptide signaling actually appeared to be protective against development of gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. And this fits, we think, with some of the earlier work on the biology of these, of, of, of these proteins where they actually may play a protective role and then are increased in response to and to compensate for, for, for decompensated cardiovascular pathophysiology. And in fact, our findings provide human genetic validation for this fairly unexpected um, observational association that was reported last year in JAMA Cardiology. So also using the new MOM2B study, the authors measured first trimester anti-pro BNP levels, and I think expected to find that higher levels were predictive of, of, of hypertension in pregnancy. But again, they observed the opposite, that actually lower first trimester circulating anti-pro BNP, uh, lower levels appeared to be associated with increased risk, both of an HDP and of having chronic hypertension. Um, at follow-up, and this just, to, we know that things like obesity and adiposity can confound these measurements, but this was after accounting for those things, as well as differences in race and ethnicity. 
And so it may actually be that the natriuretic peptides play other roles simply beyond volume management and blood pressure regulation in the context of pregnancy. For example, some preclinical work suggests that atrial natriuretic peptide might play a role in early uterine artery decidualization and spiral artery remodeling, um, the, a process that we know is impaired and deranged in the context of preeclampsia. Next, we asked whether there might be any clinical utility to generating polygenic scores for these conditions. And one might ask, what would you do with that information in the context of a patient who's pregnant? Like, how are you going to use that information? Is there anything we would do with that information? And the answer is you might give a patient aspirin for preeclampsia prevention who you might not otherwise think to do it. Um, and so, you know, just to be clear, we, we um, derived and uh, externally validated polygenic scores for both preeclampsia and gestational hypertension. And we leveraged the fact that there was very strong genetic correlation between each of these traits and blood pressure to boost score performance and combined scores um, in linear combination to improve performance and showed that they were quite quite predictive in these external cohorts, and then found that if we treated po high polygenic risk as another major risk factor for preeclampsia, like sort of you know, building on the framework of the US PSTF guidelines and saying, if you treat pre uh, polygenic risk as another major risk factor, can we improve allocation of aspirin? And indeed, we observed significant re net reclassification if we, if we added either the top five or 10% of polygenic risk um, to conventional clinical risk factors. The last point I'll just sort of say about um, some of the, some of the uh, research we've done to try to understand the links between preeclampsia and later life cardiovascular disease is inspired by the observation that this is really a disease of the microvasculature. In the acute setting, we see really endothelial and microvascular dysfunction. And so that led us to ask the question, can we detect differences in the microvasculature of affected women in midlife, so beyond the reproductive years? And so to do that, we collaborated with folks here at Mass General and the Broad Institute, and we trained a deep learning model to analyze retinal fundus photographs from about uh, 50,000 UK biobank participants, of which about 20,000 were women who had born children at some point. And so we focused on that group and we looked to see to look, we, we looked at several different measures of uh, retinal vascular health, density, branch and complexity. And what we found is after we adjusted for every conceivable cardiometabolic trait and risk factor, including things like blood pressure and non-invasively measured arterial stiffness, women with preeclampsia still had evidence of impaired microvascular density and microvascular health in midlife. Um, interestingly, women with gestational hypertension only did not, suggesting that there are actually really fundamental differences in the biology or the predisposition to these different conditions, and suggesting that microvascular dysfunction, which we know is also a setup for things like HEFPEF, might be an important mediator of long-term cardiovascular risk in this population. The question comes up, are preeclampsia and gestational hypertension causal for later life cardiovascular disease, or are they simply reflecting pre-existing or latent risk stuff that's already there? Um, and so to try to have more insights into that question, we performed a phenome-wide association study, uh, a FEWAS for short, where we look at the, the, the genetically predicted risk of uh, a condition like preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, and whether that associates with a host of later life conditions, spanning from infectious, neoplastic, endocrine, et cetera, et cetera. They're grouped by a sort of ICD category here. And you can see, perhaps unsurprisingly, based on what I've already told you, that genetic risk for preeclampsia very, very, very strongly associates with later life risk of hypertension. These p-values here are uh, less than you know, 10 to the negative 110 10 to the negative 115. We also see very highly statistically significant associations with things like atherosclerosis, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, and why I show this to you is because these are actually phenome-wide associations performed in men specifically. So what this suggests is that the genetic predisposition to um, preeclampsia 
is a setup for cardiovascular disease, whether or not you actually experience preeclampsia. And so the interpretation of this is this is more likely shared risk factors with 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 with, uh, with coronary artery disease, shared genetic risk, or other shared shared risk factors, rather than necessarily being causal on its own. Having said all that. More recently, there's been some interesting data that maybe suggests that this is, in fact, a bidirectional relationship. And this is, I should say, an entirely preclinical data using, using a mouse model of preeclampsia where SFLIT is overexpressed for a period in pregnant mice. And what the investigators found, this was Iris Jaffe's lab at Tufts, what they found is that in this SFLIT overexpression model of preeclampsia in mice, that you know, at two months postpartum, if you expose these mice to prohypertensive stimuli, uh, like angiotensin II or salt load, that they displayed this sort of enduring hypersensitivity to these prohypertensive stimuli, um, increased microvascular reactivity in the mesenteric microvasculature, higher blood pressure, and other things like that. So, so this is sort of initial preclinical evidence that actually maybe there is something causally influenced by experiencing preeclampsia that changes a woman's sensitivity or predilection to develop hypertension later. So I think more to come on this, really interesting. All right, so all that science is really, really interesting, whatever. But like, what does this mean for the patient I'm caring for who has a history of hypertension in pregnancy, either preeclampsia or gestational hypertension? Well, we don't have super clear guide, guidelines at this point. There is a scientific statement from the AHA which at a high level advises frequent monitoring of cardiovascular risk factors in the first year postpartum. And candidly, I think we could actually debate whether that's a useful recommendation or not, given how crazy the first year postpartum is for new mothers. Um, and also in the context of things like breastfeeding, how that influences measured levels of lipids. Um, so we can debate that one. I think probably the more important and the recommendation I strongly agree with is ensuring that these patients do transition to longitudinal primary care because we know um, from published experience that a lot of these patients fall out of care for years after having children and aren't seen again until much later in life, off, sometimes with a first cardiac event. So and that's arguably, I think, the most important thing to come out of that scientific statement. If we fast forward to midlife individuals, and I suspect many in this group will know this, but uh, you know, the ACC AHA in the 2018 cholesterol guidelines for the first time proposed this concept of risk enhancing factors to guide statin prescribing decisions when folks were at borderline or intermediate risk. And the risk enhancing factor list includes adverse pregnancy outcomes like preeclampsia, gestational hypertension, and gestational diabetes as these risk enhancing factors that should up classify risk. What else can, what else should we be talking about with our patients? What else should we be thinking about? Well, it might be that the basics, sort of help, the heart healthy lifestyle um, modifications that are the cornerstone of cardiovascular disease prevention might be particularly important in this population. Um, so these are observational data from the Nurses Health Study, which showed that after pregnancy complicated by a hypertensive complication, um, if women returned to a normal body mass index in the in the um, in the postpartum period, they were substantially less likely to progress to chronic hypertension compared to those who who, who don't return to a normal um, BMI uh, and sort of had a similar pattern of findings with physical activity, although less marked in terms of its magnitude of protective effect. Again, these are observational data. Lifestyle modification for new moms is really super hard, and there might be something fundamentally different about women who are able to return to a normal BMI versus those who aren't. Uh, but nonetheless, suggestive that 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 these sort of maintaining maintaining a normal body weight and adopting healthy behaviors might be particularly important. This concept of the postpartum transitional clinic has emerged based on some limited published experience and then some other anecdotal experience from centers throughout North America. The concept of the postpartum transitional clinic um, is potentially multifold with, with mul serving multiple roles. It's, it's a structure that might either be physical or virtual or something else designed to bridge women from a complicated delivery, ideally to longitudinal care, either primary care and or specialty care. Um, some of the across town at Brigham and Women's in Boston, there's a fairly robust program whose focus is actually largely on preventing hypertensive postpartum readmissions, um, as these are a 
fairly common cause of, of postpartum readmissions in the postpartum population, but secondarily also use that as an opportunity to educate women about the long-term risk of cardiovascular disease associated with things like preeclampsia to try to start, you know, to try to inspire lifestyle modification now and change some of those long-term cardiometabolic uh, risk trajectories. I should say, uh, and so we summarized some of the published experience with this in this review from a couple of years ago for those who are interested in learning more about this. I will be very transparent in saying this model has not been evaluated prospectively. And so we actually don't know um, the impact of this model on care is in comparison with usual care. And I think perhaps more importantly, I, I suspect it's helpful for from a from a postpartum readmission standpoint. Whether this is adequate to bend long-term cardiometabolic risk trajectories, I think we don't know that. And I think given how crazy again the first year postpartum is for new moms, I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily assume that this is enough. And so this might be a first step, but this may or may not be adequate. Folks may have seen this paper published in JAMA earlier this year. These are um, data from the Swedish Scapus Registry of Coronary CT Angiography. Um, and in this paper, the authors examined a subset of approximately 10,500 uh, childbearing women in the Scapus Registry and looked at uh, a variety of adverse pregnancy outcomes and whether that pregnancy history predicted uh, a, a variety of coronary CTA findings, including things like any detectable atherosclerosis, significant stenosis, high coronary artery calcium scores, and the like. Um, and I'm showing here just the data for preeclampsia, although the findings were similar for gestational hypertension, with you know 2.5-fold risk of any significant stenosis, which they defined as a luminal narrowing greater than or equal to 50%, so, so CADRADS, three or higher if you're using the CADRADS score a 2.1-fold risk of multi-segment involvement and 1.8-fold risk of a calcium score greater than 100. I may or may not have said that these were women aged 50 to 65 at the time of assessment, um, sort of late mid to late 50s on average. Um, I think a, a clinically helpful take-home point is you know, as, as you're seeing patients like this in clinic, um, and again, we have to extrapolate a fairly healthy Swedish population to our perhaps less healthy U.S. population, but you know, benchmarking from the Swedish population, 40% with a history of a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy had any detectable athero by CT, and 10% had a coronary artery calcium score greater than 100. So to summarize this first part, preeclampsia really represents a red flag of maternal cardiovascular risk, both over the short and long term, um, characterized by diverse cardiovascular disease pathologies over the long term. Chronic hypertension and microvascular aging appear to be key mediators, maybe not the only mediators, but certainly uh, I think we appreciate important. And based on you know, what we understand of the science now, and there's a lot of investigation in the space ongoing, I use a history of preeclampsia as an opportunity for patient education about cardiovascular risk, an opportunity for aggressive early primordial prevention to prevent development of overt cardiovascular risk factors and primary prevention of those risk factors to prevent cardiovascular disease and increasingly have a low threshold to obtain a calcium score for risk refinement if I'm at all uncertain about what to recommend for patients. So I'll shift gears a little bit now and turn jump, jump ahead a little bit in the reproductive lifespan to menopause. Um, as, I, I'm, as I suspect this group knows well, Earlier age of menopause has been fairly consistently associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease in the observational literature. Um, these are um, data from an individual patient level meta-analysis of age of natural menopause that was published a few years ago in the Lancet Public Health. And um, in part based on these data and others, uh, premature menopause defined as occurring before age 40 is now incorporated in, in the ACCAHA guidelines as yet another sex-specific risk-enhancing factor for ASCVD. We used the UK Biobank again to look at the risk associated with both natural and surgical menop premature menopause in that cohort against a variety of cardiovascular conditions not limited to atherosclerotic. And so in our primary analysis, we looked at a composite of eight cardiovascular conditions, we adjusted for every conceivable cardiometabolic risk factor and trait. And what we observed is that women with a history of natural premature menopause, which also known as premature ovarian insufficiency, had a 36% increased risk 
um, for composite cardiovascular disease, and those with surgical premature menopause had an 87% increased risk. And this, we observed this graded relationship with progressively larger hazards associated with pro progressively earlier age of menopause, um, and sort of this trend toward higher risks for surgical compared to naturally induced menopause. And just to highlight, some of these hazard ratios for aortic stenosis in particular are really strikingly large. This is like a hazard ratio of 17 for um, surgical menopause before age 30. I'm not sure we actually know understand this biology well at all. And so I think it's sort of a fertile area for future investigation. Um, uh, yes. So, and then we, again, working in a human genetics lab, we then asked the question, you know, can genetics help us understand these relationships better as well? And so we, you know, we, we reflected on the fact that when you look at genome-wide association studies of age of natural menopause, so genetic determinants of timing of menopause, about two thirds of the genes that have been implicated in this, in this phenotype are linked to, to DNA damage repair and genomic stability. So that, that got us thinking about other forms of genomic stability and instability that have been linked to cardiovascular disease. And one of those is this entity called CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. So what the heck is CHIP? CHIP is a little bit of a complex concept. I'm happy to sort of take questions about this to clarify if, if anything about this is unclear. You can think of it as a pre-pre-pre-leukemic state in a way. Um, it's the expansion of a blood stem cell population that harbors one or more mutations that have been linked to the future development of leukemia. Um, we define it for largely technical reasons as a prevalence in cer peripheral circulating blood cells greater than or equal to 2%. Um, this is usually or historically has been ascertained primarily using techniques like whole exome and whole genome sequencing. We increasingly now have targeted low-cost panels that can do this. The three most common chip mutations are, just to, just to say the names so that you start to recognize them if you hear them in the future, are DNMT3A, TET2, and ASXL1, all of which are involved in epigenetic regulation. Um, and the CHIP as a condition is substantially more common and substantially more prevalent than actual blood cancer. Um, so these are the prevalence of, of CHIP plotted over time, uh, excuse me, plotted against age on the horizontal axis here across several studies. And in general, we say that at least 10% of individuals have one or more CHIP mutation by age 70. So really pretty common if you look across the population. All right, so why am I talking to cardiologists about CHIP? Well, we already talked about the, the, the associated risk of blood cancer, which makes sense. These are blood cancer associated mutations, but the absolute risk of blood cancer and in, even in individuals who have chip mutations is quite low at less than 1% per year. And this cancer risk is actually insufficient to explain the 40% increased risk of all cause mortality that's been observed in this population. Studies actually have subsequently showed really over the last decade that most of this excess risk is actually attributable to cardiovascular disease. Um, with mouse experiments fairly convincingly demonstrating a causal relationship of CHIP for aggravating or accelerating atherosclerosis, particularly for key subtypes like TED2. And with that in mind, CHIP-directed precision therapeutics are already actually in clinical development at this point. To just sort of underscore the relevance in the secondary prevention population, these are some data that we published earlier this year, looking at 13,000 individuals with established atherosclerotic disease in the UK Biobank. And fortunately, actually, DNMT3A, which is the most common chip mutation, did not uh, was not associated with a statistically significant increased risk in recurrent ASCVD or mortality, but several other common types were, including uh, TET2, and part of why that's important is because TET2 might be the, the subtype of CHIP. It's the second most common subtype at a population level. It appears to be strongly linked to inflammation as a potential mechanism of accelerated atherosclerosis, and that might have some precision medicine consequences. So these are data from the CANTOS trial. So by way of reminder, CANTOS was a large um, sort of combined phase two, phase three outcomes trial of canakinumab and the secondary prevention population with high CRP. And a fairly substantial subset of CANTOS participants underwent whole exome sequencing to ascertain CHIP status at baseline. And you know, with some power limitations, nonetheless, there was this fairly striking 
indication of an interaction where individuals who harbored TET2 chip specifically, so again, that second most common ch chip subtype, appeared to derive particularly large magnitude of risk reduction from canakinumab with a hazard ratio of 0 0.38 compared to patients, say, without chip, um, where the, the hazard ratio was substantially closer to the null. Um, and then also there was actually the, the hazard ratio for other chip patients as well was not that much lower than this. So really a lot of the benefit appeared to concentrate in patients who had tattoo chip. Okay, why am I talking about chip in the context of menopause? Well, again, we, we just talked about how early age of menopause might be a signal for genomic instability. And so we look to see is CHIP more prevalent in women who experience premature age of menopause? And in fact, that appeared to be the case in both the UK Biobank and the Women's Health Initiative with approximately 60% crude increased prevalence of CHIP um, in women with premature menopause, which are the groups shown in red here, compared to those without premature menopause, which are the group, groups shown in blue. And this was seen across the life course with chronologic age displayed on the horizontal axis. And to make things even more complicated, it appeared that this increased prevalence was really restricted to women who experienced natural or spontaneous menopause and not surgical menopause. Now, why is this important? Because one might be tempted to say, to think, as we, we've done for decades now, that everything related to menopause is all about postmenopausal sex hormone deficiency. But if that were the case, we would expect to see similar odds associated with premature menopause in both groups. So the fact that this really segregates with spontaneous natural menopause actually suggests that there might be shared upstream risk factors, shared predilection to genomic instability underlying both phenotypes, both the premature natural menopause and the excess prevalence of CHIP. We finally confirmed that CHIP is indeed an independent risk factor for incident coronary artery disease in postmenopausal women specifically, something that hadn't been shown before. One other aspect of genomic stability that we've looked at more recently um, that has also um, been associated with CHIP and potentially age of menopause is our telomeres. So as I suspect this group knows, telomeres are these repetitive DNA sequences with nucleoprotein capsid, um, a nucleoprotein cap that stab stabilizes and protects the ends of chromosomes and tries to prevent their shortening um, with successive cell replication. But inevitably, telomeres do shorten with aging and with cellular division, and so they're not they're not completely effective at, at doing this. And when telomeres become critically short, the DNA damage repair machinery recognizes this and induces something called a senescence-associated secretory phenotype, or SASP, um, that is designed primarily to shut down replication of an unstable chromosome, but secondarily, it's pro-inflammatory and promotes cardiovascular disease. And so we looked to, to see, is age of menopause linked to differences in, in telomere length that might explain some aspect of this relationship? And if you look on the left, if we focus on women who underwent natural menopause, where we could sort of clearly ascertain the age of menopause, there was this very clear graded relationship adjusted for chronologic age and everything else of shorter telomere length in women um, with premature and early age of menopause compared to those with sort of average or later than average age of menopause. And then further showing that this telomere length appeared to stratify risk of cardiovascular disease that was associated with premature menopause. So to summarize this portion, we know that cardiovascular risk accelerates following the menopause transition and that menopause, premature age of menopause is a guideline endorsed risk enhancing factor for cardiovascular disease that actually predicts diverse CVD outcomes beyond uh, conventional ASCVD. Somatic genomics may play a role in linking premature age of menopause to CVD, both in the form of clonal hematopoiesis and possibly um, through, uh, through telomere biology as well. You know, in the clinical setting, when I'm seeing patients who have this similar to the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, I really use this as an opportunity for conversations about very early and aggressive primordial and primary prevention, consideration of early calcium scoring. And for, for CHIP specifically in the near future, this might be an opportunity for novel precision prevention strategies as well. So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to sort of reflect a little bit on how we might imagine um, advancing, further advancing research and clinical care in women's cardiovascular health. I think one thing, and th th this is this point is actually not entirely restricted to women, um, but I think 
pregnancy sort of brings this to light more and more that we have historically ignored overt cardiometabolic and cardiovascular risk in early life, young adulthood, and the reproductive years, sort of under the assumption that those individuals short-term uh, cardiovascular disease risk is low, but we know from, you know, mounting evidence that even childhood burden of cardiovascular risk factors very potently predicts um, midlife and later life cardiovascular disease risk. And actually having prehypertension and overt hypertension in the reproductive years is abnormal, even though it's becoming increasingly common. A lot of this is Really, you know, we like to think that as clinicians, we have a lot of control over this. And I certainly think it's appropriate to have these conversations with our patients. But a lot of this really strongly reflects the broader social determinants of health, the built environment that folks live in, the foods that people have access to. Like a lot of this sits outside our office. And I think as a preventive cardiologist, I, I kind of feel increasingly that sort of advocacy around these things is part of my job as a preventive cardiologist, because there's only so much I'm going to be able to move the needle with, with the tools that we have at a population level. Uh, I also think that um, cardiology can't actually shoulder all of this burden. Like these, these patients aren't referred to us until they've got, till they're much later in life typically. And so we really need to engage our our pediatrics, general adult medicine, and OBGYN and colleagues around th these concepts, because um, if, if they wait to see a cardiologist to hear this news, it's generally too late. Lastly, and relatedly, I think this notion that sort of came out of sort of er the early days of statins when they were expensive and brand name, that's with a sort of arbitrary focus on 10-year risk to guide preventive prescribing decisions does not make sense in young adults, because our risk calculators will always estimate low risk in these patients by virtue of young age. Age is the single strongest determinant of risk in these risk calculators. But individuals who have overt risk factors and extremely high lifetime risk might still have low 10-year predicted risk. And that you're we're not doing them a service if we're over, ignoring their overt risk factors today. So I think there's growing recognition that young adults really, we should be focused, shifting our focus to a lifetime risk horizon you know, we don't have a good, robust, validated, widely used lifetime risk calculator. To my knowledge, there's the the Framingham 30-year risk calculator has been developed, sort of validated largely in white, white adults, not widely used in clinical practice. I think there's opportunities here. Um, and in clinic, what I do, I don't formally calculate young adults. You know, when adults are under 40, I'm not formally calculating anybody's risk score, but I'm certainly gestalting what I think their lifetime risk is um, and having those conversations with patients. Just as a little bit of local data here from Boston to underscore how badly we undertreat over risk factors in young adults, we did a little bit of a local QI project a couple of years ago. This was led by one of our um, former residents, now a fellow at U University of Washington, Shauna Newton, where we looked at young adults in our broader mass general Brigham system who had severe hypercholesterolemia defined as an LDL greater than or equal to 190 milligrams per deciliter. This is a group where you know, the guidelines are very clear. Class one recommendation, statin therapy to reduce LDL cholesterol by at least 50%. It, this shouldn't be a controversial uh, recommendation. And we just, we just look to see in a cohort who had an initial LDL cholesterol greater than or equal to 190, and we followed them for an average of eight years, how many were prescribed statins, how many achieved guideline recommended reduction in, in cholesterol by at least 50%. And there were, the results, perhaps unsurprisingly, were dismal, even in, a, even in a system that really believes in LDL and LDL modification to reduce risk. You know, the, the average LDL cholesterol on this overall cohort out to 15 years was about 150. So well above the, the, the guideline recommended LDL target. Um, fewer than a third of these individuals achieved 50% reduction. Just about half overall were prescribed lipid lowering therapy at all over eight years of follow-up. And Again, perhaps unsurprisingly, women were much less likely than men to be prescribed lipid lowering therapy, which we hypothesize probably relates to concerns about things like teratogenicity um, in, in women who might be pregnancy capable or planning pregnancy. So um, pretty damning local QI. And I would sort of say, again, this is a system that believes in these things. So if it looks this bad here, it's probably not much better most other places. What else should we be doing to move the needle to advance women's heart health? There are fundamental gaps in the in our understanding of the biology of some of these 
first of all, just of reproductive life, life course transitions in general, we incompletely understand the biological impact, drivers and impacts of menopause. We incompletely understand the acute effects of pregnancy on the cardiovascular system. There's just fundamental biology where we don't have all the answers still. And similarly, for many of our, the, the sex specific or sex predominant conditions that we care for in cardiology, including really common things like HFPF, we have really fundamental gaps in our mechanistic understanding of these conditions. Some ways that we can think about improving this is improving the capture and accuracy of some of these sex specific and sex predominant risk factors and things like biobanks and the EHR and large cohorts and clinical trials. Um, you know, the, the All of Us program is, is, a, is sort of the U.S. response to the U.K. Biobank, and I think, unfortunately, has really missed an opportunity to capture a lot of these things. They're not really trying to capture a lot of these variables in their, in their structured systematic surveys. Um, I can say from some recent work that I've done um, trying to recruit women sort of from labor and delivery and in the postpartum setting, um, it's really hard, understandably really hard engaging new mothers in research. And I think funders need to understand that um, if we're going to really study these, study the peripartum and postpartum period and understand cardiovascular physiology in this time, we really need to actually have adequate funding to support things like childcare and transportation and other things that we need to really successfully study these patients. The last concept I'm going to leave you with, because I, I want to leave time for questions and discussion, is this notion of Rose's prevention paradox. So Jeffrey Rose published this concept in the, in the BMJ in the early 1980s, and that was this, this notion that most clinical atherosclerotic events across a population occur in individuals who do not have high predicted risk. And this seems a little bit perhaps confusing or counterintuitive because within a high risk group, by definition, they have the highest risk. But the issue is the denominator. There's just so many more people who don't have high predicted risk. And so even though their relative risk is lower, they account for a larger proportion of cases. And I think, what are the implications of this insight? It's either that we should be applying certain low-tech, cheap, cost-effective interventions broadly across the population, hearkening back to things like social determinants of health. But also we should get smarter about refining risk assessment and modification and asking our female patients, systematically ascertaining these sex-specific risk factors and things like reproductive history is one very quick, efficient, low, low-tech way to get smarter about refining risk assessment. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. I will... Um, thank my funders, funding sources, my my sort of boss and co-conspirator and primary mentor, Pradeep Natarajan, who's our director, director of preventive cardiology here at Mass General. Um, the nature of the work that we do is extremely collaborative by design. So this is just a fraction of the people um, who made the work I shared today possible. There are many more who don't fit on the slide. Um, thanks so much again for the kind of invitation today and uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, Dr. Honigsberg, that was a fantastic talk. I uh, sat here. My name is Gautam Kumar. Uh, I uh, don't see any questions in the chat box, but I will start the first uh, wave of questions, if you like. Um, one of the things that struck me sitting here it, there's, uh, is that there is a whole uh, area of research in terms of socioeconomic determinants of health, especially pertaining to preeclampsia and subsequent cardiovascular risk. Uh, and how that interacts with uh, genetics, especially in uh, minority women. And is there any work uh, with uh, trying to tease apart how much of this subsequent risk is more related to uh, socioeconomic issues versus being related to genetic risk um, based on um, uh, what's going on? That is such a good and important question, and I don't have the answer to that question for you yet, but we are actively pursuing that, including with a with an AHA-funded grant specifically focused on that question, um, and then some other work ongoing in New mom to be So actually, we'll start to have some insight into that soon. I think what I can say is that a lot of, a lot of what we understand of the sort of epidemiology and the genetic epidemiology of these conditions come from sort of European ancestry, Northern European populations, which I think provide some insights because these are populations that are pretty healthy overall on average with respect to things like lifestyle factors. Uh, social determinants of health are a little bit less of an issue in places like Norway and Sweden, and they have great access to sort of medical care. So I don't think 
social determinants um, are, are necessarily as much at play in those contexts. But like to, I think you're asking the really good question of like, do they interact together? Are they additive? Do they compound each other? Um, how much can you offset this genetic risk? Like those are questions that I think, again, th th that's the sort of stuff that we're working on now, but I don't think we have the robust data to say the answer just yet. Fantastic. Uh, I'm going to take a question from Dr. Mandelwart, who is uh, asking about thoughts on why DET2 was the most uh, predictive of the chip genes shown. Yeah, it's a great question. And so TET2 is sort of emerging um, of the more common chip driver mutations, at least. TET2 seems to be like consistently the worst actor, both for atherosclerotic outcomes as well as you know, recent data published in circulation, specifically on heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Um, we have some data um, coming soon focused on arrhythmia risk. Um, the, the short answer now from what we understand is inflammation, which, sound, <laughs> which sounds very glib, but we really have very sort of robust um, sort of preclinical data from mice showing that my, when, you, when you transplant TET2 deficient bone marrow into mice, their circulating levels of things like IL-1 beta and IL-6 are higher. Humans with TET2 have higher IL-1 beta and IL-6. Um, there's this interesting line of genetics research where we sort of can use germline genetic variation as a proxy for modifying certain pathways. And so there's this very common um, variant in the IL-6 receptor that affects about 40% of the population, where 40% of the population has a low, just sort of like a lower inflammatory set point, essentially. And for folks who have that seemingly protective variant in the IL-6 receptor, they're less likely to develop cardiovascular disease in the context of TET2 chip. And then there's the Cantos data. So inflammation and particularly things along the NLRP3, IL1, NLRP3 inflammasome, IL1 beta, IL6 pathway seem to be particularly important. Other types of chip seem to actually have quite different effects potentially on inflammatory signaling. There's recent data on TP53 really being more potentially a monocyte driven process, not necessarily NLRP3 inflammasome driven. Um, and then for some of the other less common um, driver mutations, we understand that that pathophysiology less well. Um, great. Uh, Michael, our next question comes from uh, Gina Lundberg. And uh, you may or uh, may not have heard of Dr. Lundberg. She's done a lot of work on women and cardiovascular disease. Uh, her question is basically, are you doing any work with genome studies in women with severe and prolonged vasomotor symptoms after menopause. Uh, hi, Gina. Great to hear from you. Um, that uh, it's a great question. Um, we are not doing that work now, um, in part because of sort of this relates to one of one of my closing thoughts, which is that we haven't done a great job in large genotyped cohorts, cohorts where we have genetic data that would allow these sorts of studies of really robustly ascertaining things like severity and duration of, of vasomotor symptoms. I think there are emerging opportunities in this, um, but that's part of why we, we, we aren't now, but there might be opportunities in the near future as things like all of us sort of continue to recruit. Um, the next question comes from uh, uh, Kosro Niazi, who is one of our experts in uh, peripheral vascular disease and interventional cardiology whose question is basically, are there any specific drugs that may have better results in treating HDP? And maybe to give some granularity to this, you know, I get the fact that there may be a group of drugs that are probably usable in while the woman is actually pregnant, and there's probably groups of drugs that are usable after. Uh, and uh, maybe you can give us some uh, similarities and differences between the two, which may probably lead to a lecture by itself, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a, it's a great question. I think there's a couple, there's a couple potentially interesting and important pieces to this question. The first, as you said, is sort of like, what can we use safely to treat hyper chron mild chronic hypertension in pregnancy, acute hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, postpartum blood pressure management in women after a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy? And like, is there any data that this population over the long term should be treated one way or the other? So pregnancy compatible antihypertensives that are very commonly used, you know, in the, the population who's still pregnant, 
the, our go-tos, sort of our go-tos and OBGYN's go-tos as well is really labetalol and nifedipine are by far the most commonly used. There are others that are probably safe, but those are the two with sort of like the most sort of clinical experience and sort of a sense that they are safe. Um, the, um, in the postpartum setting, we can add ACE certain ACE inhibitors to that repertoire. So enalapril in particular, very commonly used and is compatible with breastfeeding. Um, and there's some, uh, I think, early data suggesting that particular there might be particularly favorable microvascular effects of the ACE inhibitor specifically that might make those a good choice, although that's it's sort of dealer's choice right now in terms of what people are using in actual clinical practice. I think the question, there, there, you, this may or may not have been your question, but sort of are there particular drugs we should be using in this population over the longer term, or is just any amount of blood, is any aggressive blood pressure lowering enough or are certain agents more long-term cardioprotective than others? We don't know the answer to that question yet, but it's an interesting uh, line of inquiry. Um, it is uh, 8.32 right now. Uh, I think the questions are still coming. Uh, but I think we probably need to close the session at this point. Uh, Dr. Honigsberg, thank you so much for taking the time. I believe uh, there will be more opportunity for faculty to interact with you later uh, today as uh, part of the other uh, Zoom meetings as well. Yes, exactly. Thank you again so much for the invitation. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.